Well, 2021, and so I want to talk this morning about two spiritual disciplines. And you see them on the screen. One, I am convinced, is mandatory. One is optional. And I think you'll see that as the lesson unfolds today. You know, a lot of times when we hit 1-1 one, one, uh, of a new year, we have what is referred to as resolutions. Well, I want to change the word today. I want to change the word because resolution is a cliche and people say, well, I'm not going to do this or I am going to do that or whatever the case might be. And uh, I, I can tell there are just a few of us that were wise enough to remember Bowtie Sunday, Doug. There was one or two in the earlier service and, uh, uh, you know, and I, I appreciate the, the lack of comments that you've made about my bow tie today. Lyle T. is the only one who said, I look like I should be on top of a cake. <laughs> Love you too, brother. But we're going to talk about two spiritual disciplines. And, and, and you know, I, I don't want to say specifically about this, but, but I know I, I saw Tina and I saw Jenny Lynn making some goals, not resolutions, but goals for 2021. And so today I want us to think about that because after all, isn't it true that we are called upon to imitate Jesus, to be like Jesus? I mean, isn't that what Cain just read in Luke 6 and verse 40? A disciple is not above his master. A teacher is not above his, uh, a student is not above his teacher. That's what Luke 6, 40 says. So we are to be like Jesus in Luke 6 and verse 40. There was a scripture in 1 Peter 2, 21. It says, because Christ had suffered for us, watch this, he left us an example that we should follow his steps. Follow his steps in imitating him. And how do we imitate Jesus? Well, Luke 11 and verse 1, you know what it says? Lord, teach us to pray. Interesting that of all the things the disciples could have asked for when they were with Jesus, they asked how to pray. So I want to spend the first half of our message talking about teaching us to pray. And I'm going to mention a number of words. They begin with the letter S. And you can put these in the margin of your Bible and you can have these for 2021 so that you and I can have a greater prayer life. The first one is serious. I mean, when you go to Matthew 6 and verse 9, Jesus begins the model prayer. You know how he begins the model prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, when we're talking to God, we have to realize that's serious business. We're talking to the creator of the universe. We're talking to God, our Father. We need to be serious about our prayer lives. Not just make it, uh, let's say a few words and get it over with and get it done, but be serious about it. Because after all, most of the time we do it in secret. When you go to Matthew 6 and verse 5, Jesus says, and when you pray in your secret place, and hopefully everybody in the room has a place that they can go to in prayer. I mean, think about it. If the local prison system has to provide prayer mats for the Muslims who are in jail so they can pray at 9, 12, and 3, surely where you work, the person that is over you will give you a few minutes where you can stop and go to a secret place and pray. Now, just a few minutes ago, Adam led our public prayer. And that's a prayer on behalf of the entire church. And that's a little bit different prayer than what you would pray in your secret place. I don't know who has the closing prayer today, but when they have the closing prayer, that's not something where you spend 20 minutes. You just end the service and the prayer is done, and then the service is done, so to speak. But that, that's a different kind of prayer. But we're talking about your individual prayer life where you go to your secret place and you get down on your knees, if you will, and you approach God and you talk to God in secret. And nobody else has to know what that prayer entails but just you and God. The third S is specific. Your prayers, secret prayers, your private prayers need to name names. I mean, they really do. 
I like James 5 and verse 16. He says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. The effective or effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or does a lot of good. You need to, in your secret prayer, you need to pray specific prayers. You need to name names. I talked in the service at 830 about a couple that I met in the foyer and they told me we pray for you every day. And I said, thank you. <laughs> no greater favor that you can do for another person than to call their name out in prayer. And I'm here to tell you today and I don't mind telling you that I need your prayers for ministry. I need your prayers and I'm going to ask you in your own private prayers. You pray for me and I'll pray for you. We'll make a little package deal here. We need to be specific. Let me give you an example of this. Last night, just before the Kentucky game, and no, I did not pray for a win, but, but just before that game, got a telephone call. It came to Jenny Lynn's phone and she happened to be with us and it was a phone call for me. And it was about a dear friend of ours who left this world early yesterday morning. And the daughter of the father that she just lost asked me if I would come back to Frankfurt and conduct his memorial service. And I said, if it's humanly possible and it's between my power whatsoever and I can get away, I said, I will do what I can for you and this family because her mother who just lost her husband, specifically asked if I could come back and do it. Well, since that time, I have specifically prayed for this family in my prayers because of the loss that they're experiencing. Be specific in your secret prayer life and call people's names out and specific situations. Literally call out those situations to God. Number four, a surrendered prayer life. You say, well, what is that about? When you go back to Matthew chapter 26, starting about verse 36 down through verse 46, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying in the garden. And he prayed three times the same prayer. You know what it was? If it be possible, let this cup of anguish and suffering, let it pass from me. But watch, watch, the, re, watch the little qualifier Jesus put in here. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. I'm here to tell us this morning, if 99.9% if .9 of your prayer life is about you, what you want, what your prayer requests are, I'm telling you it's not going to get higher than the ceiling. You know why? You're not praying a surrendered prayer. You're not praying, Lord, your will be done and not specifically mine. We have to remember that we are praying for what's best. Not necessarily what we think is best because we look short term, God looks long term. And that's one of the problems we have in prayer. We say sometimes, well, God didn't answer my prayer. God didn't answer my prayer. And you know what? Five years later, we look back and you know what we remember? He did answer my prayer. He gave me exactly the answer that I needed at that time, even though I didn't realize it. Pray a surrendered prayer. And, and be sincere in your prayer. Romans 10 and verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You know, you know what Paul was praying? He was praying sincerely for the Israelites. He had a sincere prayer to God. Now, I'm not suggesting that your prayers are not sincere. But what I am suggesting is this. Don't just mumble a few words, the same words over and over and over again like you have recited it and it comes out the same way every single time. Make it different. Make it from the heart make it heartfelt, and make it a sincere prayer to God. Make it sure. I like James 1 and verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. What does that mean? That means that when you pray, believe it, and you will receive it. That's in Mark eleven twenty four 24, and a lot of other places in the Bible. Do not pray like this. God, if it be your will, we pray that the lost will be saved. You don't have to pray that prayer. That is God's will. That's already God's will. It is God's will that we teach and converse and share and communicate and make known the gospel so that people might be saved. That is God's will. I promise you, you don't have to pray if it be your will. Now, there are other things where you do. When you pray that surrendered prayer, you have to pray if it be your will. But we need to be sure that when we're praying for wisdom, we don't say, God, 
you know, I'm asking for wisdom. You probably won't give it to me, but I need it. You don't, don't pray like that. Pray with some assurance as you pray according to the will of God. And then steadfast. I mean, look at Acts chapter 2. I mean, really. Here's the birthday of the church. And he says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship. Watch this. And in prayer. And so if we're going to say, Lord, teach us to pray. And if we're going to have a spiritually disciplined life, and if we're going to make 2021 a whole lot better than what was in the past, I promise you this is mandatory and we need to be praying in this way. Well, how are fasting and prayer connected? How are they connected? You know, what, what does fasting bring to prayer? Why is that conjunction there that brings those two together so frequently? Well, let's, let's talk about three things. Number one, fasting and prayer are about Focus. You know, one of the best parts of our worship, I believe, for most of us is about focus is the Lord's Supper. We focus on the death of Jesus. We focus on the blood that was shed. We focus on the spear that was put in his side. That, 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 that's a focus in worship. And fasting and prayer is all about our focus, but it's also about our reliance. You see, it's not about relying on my own merit. It's not about relying on my own good whatever. It's about a reliance on God, that God is the one who is in control. And that brings me to the third quick thing, importance. It, it really shows us what's important in our lives. So we're going to come back to these three words here in just a moment. Let me have you, though, take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, 16 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, 16 through 18. And notice the teaching of Jesus here right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mountain as he says these words about fasting and prayer. All right, if you're there, say amen. Oh, some of you aren't there. Matthew 6, 16 through 18, turn there. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear, watch the terminology, that they may appear to be fasting. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly." You know, if you remember all the times we went through the book of Acts, if you remembered when there was a major decision, when you knew that they were going to select officers for the church, two things that they always did. Acts 14, 23. After much prayer and fasting, these two spiritual disciplines were connected. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about fasting and, and, and what this means. And, and I really do believe it is an option. I don't think you have to do it. But I think you can do it if you choose to. Here, here are three, two or three things about fasting. Number one, when it's properly done, fasting has a tendency to draw us closer to God. I mean, it really does. Because we're, we're meditating, we're spending time, we're considering, we're pausing. If, if you have any major decision and any really any decision at all in your life, you should use these two disciplines before you buy that vehicle. You should use these two disciplines before you buy that house. You should use these two disciplines before you make, a, make an important decision. I mean, when properly done, it draws us closer to God. I want to show you a couple of these. One is in Luke chapter 2, and we'll be talking about this in our lessons from a man named Luke in just a couple of weeks. But I want, I want to share with you this fascinating lady by the name of Anna. Anna in Luke 2, verse 37. Listen to this. This woman was a widow of 84 years. Now, now, stop and think about this. You know, I got this prayer request yesterday. This couple had been married for an extended period of time. But have you ever known of a widow for 84 years? Think about it. That's a long, long time. Let's look at the rest of this. Who did not depart from the temple but serve God with fasting and prayers night and day. 
day and night, over and over again. What was Anna doing? What God asked her to do and what God called her to do. What a special servant of God she was. Look at Luke 5.33. Luke 5.33. This might be of interest to you because Jesus was questioned, why do not his disciples do like the disciples of John the Baptist? Now, there's a whole different setting and text, and I'm not going to go into it all this morning, but I want to read the verse, Luke 5.33. Then they said to him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? You remember Matthew chapter 4 and verse 2? You should remember this because this deals with one of the great temptations of history. Matthew 4 and verse 2 says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungered. This was Jesus before the great tempting and the great testing that occurred on a repeated basis over and over and over and over again. You remember Luke 13, 3? It says, And they laid hands on them, and with fasting and prayer they sent them out. Acts 13 and verse 3. So the first thing I want you to think about as far as fasting is concerned, when it's done correctly, it will draw you closer to God. The second thing I want to observe about this is what the text says in Matthew 6, 17 and 18. Don't make it obvious to others. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I want to tell you what it means. Here's what it means. It would be like me standing up here and telling you this morning this. Tomorrow... At 6 a.m., I'm going to start a fast, and I want everybody here to know about it. I want everybody in this congregation to know that I'm going to start fasting at 6 o'clock in the morning. Jesus says, don't tell anybody when you do it, but if you want to do it, just do it. I have a friend in the ministry. Every January 1st for three, four, sometimes up to seven days, he told me, that this is the way he begins his year, by fasting. It's what he does. Now, he didn't tell me that to be braggadocious. We were just talking about the subject of fasting, and he says, that's how I begin my year, with this spiritual discipline. That's, that's pretty impressive. But, but you don't have to tell anybody. You just, you just do it. And that's important to remember. So let's talk about why we do it, all right? Number one, it's very humbling. Fasting and prayer shows tremendous humility. You know what it says? God, you're the creator. I'm the created. It shows humility when we call upon God in prayer and when we decide that we do want to participate in some type of fast. Number two, it helps us to concentrate on a specific concern. I told this to the 830 group, and I want you to hear this. Now, I told it on the subject of prayer, but I'm going to tell it also on the subject of fasting. One Wednesday night in the capital city, we came together, and an announcement was made at the beginning of the service that one of our members was in the hospital in Lexington that was very, very sick. She was pregnant. And she needed some prayer. So we didn't just talk about her needing prayer. We did it. For the whole 45-minute block, we prayed specifically for that lady, her husband, her children, her baby, the whole 45 minutes. You know, somebody might be in a room today and say, well, why didn't you just spend some time in Bible study? Because we were practicing what the Bible said to do, to pray. There would be nothing wrong some Wednesday we walk in here and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to spend all of our time in prayer here tonight, just the entire 45-minute block. We did that, and do you know what? Seven or eight days later, ten days later, that lady was healed of that terrible situation she was in. The baby was fine. Everything was wonderful. Sometimes you have to concentrate on a specific area and a specific concern. And it's going to be different for each of us in this room. For some of us in this room, it's going to be a, a, a family concern that we're, we're fasting and we're praying about this. And we're just drawn near to God. For others, it's going to be financial. 
we might have found ourselves in a tough situation as we start 2021, and we're going we're gonna to fast in prayer on that specific concern. Whatever it is, fill in the blank. We do it because it helps us concentrate on that specific thing at hand. And three, we do it because it helps us to keep spiritual matters first and foremost. you got to love Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these other things will be added unto you, but seek first the spiritual things. And when you're praying and when you're fasting, what are you doing? You're seeking first spiritual matters. And then number four, and this might be the greatest challenge of all, I really believe it is. Prayer and fasting increases your self-control. Now, what's self-control? I, I want to show you what it is. Reverse the words. Self-control is the control of self. That's what it is. And, and as we begin 2021 and we think about fasting, you know, our culture is so tied to food, it's, it's tough for us to think about going 24, 36, 48, 72 hours without, without food. You know, I talked about this in the first service, and, and since he's here, I'm going to go ahead and mention it in the second service because he confessed it. You remember last Sunday night, Chris Robinson, what, what you confessed? He says, you know what? He says, and, and this, I, I'll, I'll admit that I, this, I'll confess the same thing. Chris said, I live to eat instead of eat to live. That, that's what our culture's like. I mean, it really is. And so when somebody says, oh, fasting, are you kidding me? 24, 36, 48 hours without food? I'll wilt. Well, self-control, the control of self, it is a challenge. It's not an easy thing to do. But I promise you, as we start 2021, and you just take the word resolution and take it out of the equation and put the word goal in there. I want these two spiritual disciplines, these two goals to be a part of 2021 in my life. And I don't know about you, but I have an emoji on my phone, Shed. I've got an emoji on my phone. And it shows a picture of somebody taking 2020 and just kicking it out of the way. Aren't you glad 2020 is over? Amen? We can I don't know if I heard one amen. amen. Amen? And we just kick 2020 out and we start 2021. And how are we going to start 2021? Prayer is mandatory. Fasting is optional. But let's take these two spiritual disciplines and see if they won't bring about a better 2021 in our life. Hey, this morning, you know, you know what can happen this morning? We can begin 2021 by being a Christian. You say, I've never been baptized. I've never reached the blood of Jesus. I've never had my sins passed over. What a wonderful opportunity this morning to begin 2021 by saying, today I'm going to make the decision to commit my life to Christ. And it may be, as you have listened, you've thought about, as a New Testament Christian, some things that are amiss in your life, and you say, you know what? I need to start out 2021 more committed, more dedicated, more consecrated, more focused, more reliant on God, making this of first importance, and just not, ah, I can take it or leave it. And most of the time, you leave it. Take it and run with it in 2021.